chapter eight of the forbidden way by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva the brush jeff ray was learning many things the arrival of lawrence berkeley on the scene had at first seemed rather alarming several wires in cipher before larry reached new york had apprised jeff of an uncertain state of mind in members of the directorate of the denver and western railroad company collins hardy and even jim noakes had been approached by representatives of the chicago and utah with flattering offers for their interests in the d and w and berkeley reported them on the horns of a dilemma collins and hardy were big owners of land which lay along the trunk line and were dependent on that company for all facilities for moving their wheat and other crops it had not always been easy to get cars to haul their stuff to market and this fall they only got their hay and potatoes in by a dispensation from the men higher up noakes as jeff well knew own stock in the through line but the showing of the sawatch mountain development company for the year had been so strong that he had felt sure his associates would see the importance of keeping their interests intact temporizing where they could with the denver crowd who had it in their power to threaten his connections at sawatch mulrennan was wiring jeff too copiously there was an election pending in kinney and the denver crowd had advanced a candidate for judge in opposition to the party with which pete was affiliated other reports both in new york and from the west indicated a strong pressure from the east on the officers of the d and w berkeley viewed all these indications of a concerted movement against jeff's railroad with increasing dismay and lost no time in giving him his opinion as to the possible outcome of the raid but jeff apparently was losing no sleep over the situation he was fully aware that the whole movement had originated in new york and that cornelius bent and his crowd were back of it he knew too that the amalgamated reduction company wanted his new smelter long ago he had foreseen this possibility and had laid his own plans accordingly the denver and sawatch was his with noakes collins and hardy he had a control of the denver and western but their possible defection which he had also foreseen had made other plans necessary three months before he came east he had unobtrusively secured through other persons a right-of-way from sawatch to pueblo a distance of one hundred and twenty miles the line of this survey was well to the southward and would open up a country occupied only by small settlers under the homestead laws he had turned the organization of the development company loose for two months on that vast tract of land and had at a reasonably small expense secured by purchase or long-time options the most valuable land along his new line his engineers were germans imported for the work who had no affiliations with other roads and his plans had so far worked out to a t he had also worked out on paper an irrigation scheme for the whole proposition at pueblo the new road would connect with the denver and california a line which had no connection with the chicago and utah and which had even been recently engaged in a rate war with the other roads to the coast its officers were friendly and ray's plans had all been worked out in their confidence and with their approval indeed a good part of his backing had been furnished by capitalists in san francisco jeff felt sure that the first move to capture the d and w was only a bluff and in his conferences with general bent janey and mcintyre had played a waiting game the daisy was now a producer 
not a producer like the lone tree but it was paying and the comet a new prospect that had been opened farther south was doing a business of a hundred to the ton his stamps were working night and day and the smelter was doing its share in ray's triumphant progress all his other plans were working out and the longer he could wait the more formidable he could make himself as an adversary he knew that the crux of the situation was the ambition of the amalgamated reduction company they controlled every smelting concern in three states and ray's big plant was a thorn in their side by waiting jeff hoped that he could make them show their hands so he made no attempt to force an issue being content to play the part they themselves had assigned him their hospitality his welcome into their exclusive set his use of their clubs to two of which he had been proposed for membership the business associations they were planning for him did little to convince jeff of the sincerity of their attentions but he acted the dupe with a good grace with one eye to the windward greatly amused at their friendliness which while it failed to flatter gave him an increasing sense of the importance of his mission general bent had intimated that within a week or so he would be in a position to make a definite proposition for his railroad which of course meant the absorption of ray's plant into the trust financially there were great possibilities in a friendly association with these men they were closely in touch with number blank broadway and if they chose could point the way to power such as he had never dreamed of but in his heart he mistrusted them he thought of mrs rumson's words of warning and he knew that what she said was true they would not spare him if he offered them a chance which would give them a command of the situation well they hadn't command of it yet and he knew he held some cards which they had never seen if they continued to weave their web as they had begun it there would still be time to sidestep meanwhile he gave himself up to a thorough enjoyment of the situation there was nothing he liked better than a fight and the fact that his adversaries were formidable lent a zest to the situation he reassured larry sent a lot of wires to mulrennan took a few successful flyers in the stock market which went to show that his luck had not yet turned and spent his leisure moments in a riding school uptown going over the jumps with camilla curtis janey's dinner table held nothing in common with general bent's the viands were well cooked but not heavy the wines were of a lighter variety dry for the most part and sparkling the service deft and dignified but not austere the table decorations were not made up of set pieces from the florists but came from janey's own conservatories and were more in the way of colored embroideries against the damask cloth general conversation was therefore continuous and every person at this table could see and be seen by every other the formality of the city seemed to be banished by common consent and camilla who went in with cortland bent a mischievous dispensation of miss janey felt very much at home in the frank friendly atmosphere almost all the conversation she discovered was of the horsey variety at least at camilla's end of the table where their host presided and as she had never ridden to hounds before she seized the opportunity to acquaint herself with the interesting details of the morning which awaited her the sunny brook hunt club she learned was only a mile away but on certain days the braybank hounds were used and members of the hunt club living in the vicinity added their numbers to the field there were plenty of foxes mr janey assured her and to-morrow they were to draw a cover over toward the chelton hills mrs cheyne she heard was thought to be the best horsewoman in the country her own country place was but five miles away 
and in spite of her boasted love of ease she was to be found at every meet in the season no matter how early the hour to-morrow was to be one of the big days of the year mr janey informed camilla and all the farmers over whose fields they hunted were invited to lunch after the meet in the long gallery so when in the early morning after a light breakfast mr janey's guests met on the terrace it was with a feeling of intense interest and excitement that camilla drew on her gloves and joined them of the men curtis janey worthington rumson and billy haviland wore the pink coats with the gray facings of sunnybrook while their host wore in addition the velvet cap which distinguished him as master of the hounds the hounds were already loose on the great lawn while the huntsman and whippers in rode among them the sun had not yet risen and the heavy frost which lay upon the lawns caught the chill greenish opalescent tints of the dawn mrs cheyne was already in the saddle her hunter a lean rangy boy pirouetting and mouthing his bits eager to be off the baroness charny dainty and very modish in the dark green habit and silk hat was chatting gaily with larry berkeley while a groom adjusted her stirrup leather mrs haviland ray perrault and her host were waiting for their horses which the men were bringing up from the stables curtis janey came forward gaily when camilla appeared we're all here mrs ray he greeted her the others will meet us at the chelton crossroads your horse is ready and then with a glance at her habit you're riding a cross i believe she nodded what a heavenly morning the conditions are perfect this white frost will soften at sun-up we'll have a fine run won't you let me help you mount they were all in the saddle in a few moments and walking their horses with the huntsman and hounds in the lead were soon on their way past the big entrance gates camilla saw jeff draw his horse alongside that of mrs cheyne and realized that the few days during which lawrence berkeley had been in the city had done much for her husband's appearance she saw the look and heard the laugh with which mrs cheyne greeted her husband and experienced in spite of herself a sense of annoyance that jeff continually showed a preference for her company to that of any of the other women of the party she knew that in her heart it made no difference to her into whose hands jeff entrusted himself mrs cheyne's languid air of patronage had provoked her and her pride rebelled at the thought of any slight however thoughtless at the hands of her husband but as courtland bent came alongside her she realized that the friendly relations of her husband and his feminine partner might progress far on extravagantly sentimental lines and still provide no just cause for complaint if mrs cheyne had any mental reservations her graceful back gave no sign of them she set her horse squarely even a little stiffly which brought into contrast the easy rather slouchy seat which jeff had learned on the plains but ray was in his element on a horse at least he felt himself the equal of any one in the party and need ask no favors or give any he examined mrs cheyne's costume curiously her long coat was a mere subterfuge for beneath it she wore white breeches like his own and patent leather boots her hair was done in a compact mass on the back of her head and her hat was held in place by a strong elastic band the shoulders of her coat were square and her manner easy he recalled the flowing feminine lines of her costume at dinner the night before and it seemed difficult to appreciate that she was the same person with whom he had talked so late in the smoking-room am i a freak she asked amiably or is there a hiatus somewhere i dressed in a tearing hurry without a maid oh no you're another kind of a person on the back of a horse am i how last night you were all woman you and i are making friends pretty fast but 
i was a little afraid of you why you're different at night so sleepy and handsome like a rattler in the sun the kind you hate to wake up but must to see how far he'll strike she laughed i don't know whether i like that or not and yet i think i do how am i different to-day to-day you're only part woman the rest of you is just a kid if it wasn't for that knot of hair i'd take you for a boy a very nice good-looking boy she looked up at him mischievously you know you have a faculty of saying unpleasant things very pleasantly i'm glad i look youthful my only horror is of growing old i don't think i like the idea of your thinking me anything unfeminine he glanced frankly at her protruding knee i don't most of you is woman all right but you don't scare me half as much this morning why should you be scared you haven't struck me as being a man who could be scared at anything not out here but inside in the drawing-room you've got me at a disadvantage i'm new to soft speeches low lights and the way you eastern women dress there's too much glamour i never know whether you mean what you say or whether it's all just a game <laughs> and i'm it she threw back her head and laughed with a full throat you dear delicious impossible creature don't you know that the world is a tangle of illusions and that you and i and everybody else were made to help keep them tangled nobody ever means what he says half of the joy in life consists in making people think you're different from what you are which are you the kid on the horse or the woman back there last night do you think i'll tell you no i suppose not and it wouldn't help me much if you're going to lie about it i mean he corrected if you're trying to keep me guessing my poor deluded friend you wouldn't believe me if i told you so what's the use for the present she added defiantly i'm the kid on the horse and i guess i'm it all right he laughed as they approached chelton hills they made out at the crossroads a number of figures on horseback the sun a pale madder ball had suddenly sprung from behind the hills and painted with its rosy hues the streaks of mist which hung in the valleys below them as its shadows deepened and its glow turned from pink to orange the figures at the crossroads stood out in silhouette against the frosty meadows beyond there were three women and at least a dozen men most of them wearing the club colors which took on added brilliancy as the sun emerged from behind the distant hills a cloud of vapor rose from the flanks of the horses there was much hallowing and waving of riding crops as the huntsman and his hounds rode into their midst and the two parties met a brief consultation and the hounds were sent down a narrow lane and across a wooden bridge toward a patch of woods which darkened the hillside half a mile away we'll draw that cover first said curtis janey perhaps we can coax the old chelton fox to come out to-day it was the name they had given to an old quarry of theirs the elusive victor in half a dozen runs in the last few years cortland bent had refused to relinquish his post beside camilla there seemed no reason why he should since gretchen had so completely appropriated larry and jeff mrs cheyne be careful camilla he was saying you're new at this game and the going is none too safe but camilla only smiled she looked forward at mrs cheyne's intolerant back and there was a joyous flash in her eyes like the one he remembered two years ago when she led the chase of a coyote which she ran down and roped unaided she leaned forward gaily and patted her horse's neck we understand each other don't we mackinaw and then as though to express her emancipation from all earthly barriers she gave her horse's head in the pasture and followed a party which had scorned the open gate mackinaw took the three rails like a bird and shook his head viciously when camilla restrained him cortland followed her smiling and in a moment they had all stopped at the foot of the hill while the hounds went forward into the cover janey had planned well 
they waited a while chatting among themselves and then suddenly the hounds gave tongue at the farther end of the cover taking a diagonal course across an old cornfield up the hill the old fox emerged while the hounds getting the scent followed hotfoot after him tally ho was the cry from one of the whips and it echoed again and again the length of the field in a second they were off curtis janey at the lead roaring some instructions which nobody understood camilla over anxious cleared the brook at a bound and won her way among the leaders gretchen janey and mrs cheyne their horses well in hand were a little to the left following the master whose knowledge of the lay of the land foresaw that the run would follow the ridge which farther on turned to the eastward camilla only knew that she must ride straight and went forward up the hill toward the line of bushes around which the last hound had disappeared bent thundered after her watching her anxiously as she took the fence at the top of the hill a tall one and landed safely in the stubble beyond pull up a little camilla he shouted you'll blow him if you don't this may last all morning i-i can't she cried he's pulling me he doesn't want to stop and neither do i it's the twenty pounds of underweight but you'd better use your curb as they cleared the bushes they viewed again from a distance the hounds running in a straight line skirting a pasture at the edge of a wood half a mile away the field below to their left was now a thin line of single horsemen or groups of twos and threes behind bent were billy haviland and the baroness down the hill they went more carefully this time then up again over rocky ground dotted with pitfalls of ice and snow which made the going hazardous janey's crowd below on the level meadows was forging ahead but when camilla reached the top of the next hill she saw that instead of surging toward the river the hounds were far away to the right in open country and going very fast they reached the road from the meadow just as curtis janey closely followed by gretchen and mrs cheyne larry and jeff came riding into the open have you viewed cortland bent pointed with his crop and they all saw the pack making for the woods and the trees which lined the creek in the hollow beyond it was a wide stretch of open country made up of half a dozen fields and fences the short sharp cry of the hounds as they sighted the fox was music to camilla but the roar of the wind in her ears and the thunder of the horses hoofs were sweeter it was a race for the creek the master on his big thoroughbred was three lengths in the lead but jeff mrs cheyne and camilla just behind him were taking their jumps together at the third fence for some reason mackinaw refused and scarcely knowing how it had happened camilla slid forward over his ears to the ground she was a little stunned but managed to keep her hold on the reins and before cortland bent could dismount she was on her feet again her cheeks a little pale but in no wise injured are you hurt camilla no help me up quickly cort she had seen jeff and mrs cheyne draw rein a moment on the other side of the fence but when she rose ride on together jeff shouted something to her but she could not hear it i didn't give him his head camilla stammered i'll know better now for god's sakes be careful whispered bent if she heard him she gave no sign of it for with her face pale and her lips compressed she made a wide turn and before the rest of the field came up she had put mackinaw at the jump again giving him his head and the crop on his flank just before he rose to it the frightened animal cleared the rails with two feet to spare and a good six feet on the farther side and when jeff turned at the bank of the creek to look he saw mackinaw nobly clearing the last fence that remained between them camilla her color coming slowly back kept her eyes fixed on the smart silk hat of mrs cheyne the memory of mrs cheyne's smile infuriated her her manner was so superior her equipment so immaculate her seat such a fine pattern of english horsemanship the run was to be long they said perhaps there would still be time to show that she could ride as the boys in the west rode for every inch for every pound 
through the ford she dashed with cortland close at her heels the water deluging them both up the bank and over the rise of the hill toward a patch of bushes where the fox doubled and went straight with the wind across the valley for the hills the going was rougher here boulders stone walls and ploughed fields camilla cut across the angle and in a moment was riding beside her husband and mrs cheyne who seemed to be setting the pace are you all right jeff asked but she only smiled at him and touched mackinaw with her heel she was riding confidently now sure of herself and surer of her horse they understood each other and mackinaw responded nobly for when he found his place by the side of rita cheyne's bay mare he sensed the will of his rider that there was the horse that he must outstay the pace was terrific and once or twice camilla felt the eyes of the other woman upon her but she rode joyously grimly looking neither to left nor right as she realized that mrs cheyne's mount was tiring and that mackinaw seemed to be gaining strength at every jump the old chelton fox gained immortality that day twice the foremost hounds were snapping at his very heels when from some hidden source of energy he drew another store and ran away from them doubling through the brush and throwing them off the scent which they recovered only when he had put a safe distance between them camilla had lost her hat her hair had fallen about her shoulders and a thorn had gashed her cheek the pace was telling on mackinaw whose stride was not so long or his jumps so powerful but mrs cheyne still rode beside her her face a little paler than before but her seat as firm her hands as light as ever if there were any other riders near them both women were oblivious seeing nothing but the blur of the flying turf beneath them hearing nothing but the sharp note of the hounds in front which told that the chase was nearly ended before them was a lane with two fences of four rails and in and out with a low take-off from the meadow camilla rose in her stirrups to look and saw that mrs cheyne had drawn rein it was a jump which would tax the mettle of fresher animals with a smile on her face which might have been a counterfeit of the one mrs cheyne had worn earlier in the morning camilla turned in her saddle catching the eye of her companion and pointed with her crop straight before her to where the hounds had killed in the meadow just beyond then set mackinaw for the highest panel she could find come on mrs cheyne she cried hoarsely come on mackinaw breasted the fence and reached the road a pause of a second until camilla's spurs sank into his flanks when mad with pain he leaped forward into the air just clearing the other fence and the ditch that lay on the farther side camilla pulled up sharply as the huntsman dismounted and made his way among the dogs turning she saw mrs cheyne's horse rise awkwardly from the lane and go crashing through the fence breaking the top rail and landing in the ditch its rider thrown forward out of the saddle landed heavily and then rolled to one side and lay quiet illustration turning she saw mrs cheyne's horse go crashing through the fence with a cry of dismay camilla dismounted conscious stricken and ran to her fallen foe just as the others rode up and caught the frightened horse dear mrs cheyne she heard herself saying i'm so sorry are you really badly hurt but the only reply she got was a feeble shake of the head curtis janey brought out a brandy flask and after a sip or two mrs cheyne revived and looked about her i'm all here i think she said that was a bad cropper in my own barnyard too the brush must be yours mrs ray give me a cigarette somebody End of chapter 8